Welcome to the World Teach webinar, Discovering the Real China. Thank you for joining us as we discuss Chinese culture and our China Global Education Fellowship in the Hunan province, which will depart this coming August. We have many listeners on the line, so we're excited to start the conversation. Amongst our listeners, we have some new applicants, those that have just been accepted into the program, and others that are interested in learning more about Chinese culture and World Teach. We also have panelists joining us, including uh, from World Teach China recent alumni and the current field director. So thank you everyone for joining us. To quickly introduce myself, my name is Nolan Sutker. I'm the director of marketing and communications here at World Teach. And my international teaching experience was in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where I taught English for four years and did curriculum development at an NGO called in Hocinha, uh, a local favela in Rio. To start, let's go over our agenda. We'll spend a few minutes meeting our great panelists and learning a bit about their backgrounds. Then we'll get into some cultural topics of discussion. These include social interactions and relationships, the Chinese education system, and modern China. From there, we'll focus on the China Global Education Fellowship, program, structure, and support. After, we'll discuss living in China. What are the housing placements like and with whom will you be living? What is the monthly stipend? What activities are volunteers involved in outside of the classroom? We'll talk about safety and cultural challenges and we'll get to hear personal experiences from our alumni that are on the line with us. At the end, we will quickly address fellow qualifications and the application process before we dedicate time to a question and answer session with our panelists. Throughout the webinar, you can submit questions to the chat function that you should see on your screen. We will wait until the end to address them as a group. Let's continue. On the line with us is Jay, Jay Derek Forster. Uh, he is our country director, our current country director in World Teach China. And he's coming to us all the way from Hunan. Uh, he's going back and forth a bit with his connection there. So he will join us as soon as he can from his place in Hunan. Jay, uh, who's not there, good morning. But um, what we can do is kind of go through his biography here. Um, so as you can see, he, he's from Tampa Bay and had a degree. Uh, and his interest in how world t people outside the U.S. live led him to World Teachers China program. And he just returned to the States uh, after that program for two years and did his JD and MBA at American University. He's now been the field director for a little more than six months in Hunan and is excited to utilize his education and experience to help build World Teach's mission abroad. Next, we have our first alumni panelist, Bethany Whitfield. Bethany, thanks for being on the line with us tonight. Can you please introduce yourself? And do you remember how you first learned about World Teach and what convinced you to join the program in China? Yeah, um, well, hello, everyone. It's nice to talk with you today. Um, my name is Bethany. So I first learned about World Teach when I was um, looking at study abroad, I'm sorry, not study abroad, teaching abroad programs. Um, and I was really looking for a commitment that was going to last for about a year. Um, and some other programs were too long and some were too short, but this seemed like a good fit. Um, so yeah, I reached out and um, I, I ended up just kind of taking the plunge and, and going to China. And, and I have to say that I was working for five years beforehand. Um, so it was one of those moves where I just felt like if I didn't do it now, I wouldn't ever have the chance to do it. Um, and I'm so glad I did. So yeah, I'm just ex excited to share those experiences with you. Next, we have Suzanne. Please introduce yourself, and do you remember how you first found World Teach, and why you decided to join, and specifically why China? Well, I was. Um, my name is Suzanne Herrera, and I uh, raised my family and decided that uh, I needed something that challenged me. I've always wanted to travel, and going through the internet, I found World Teach, and. Um, I was very, very interested and, and did some research. 
um, looked at other programs, nothing compared. Um, so I just went with my gut feeling, and it was the best decision I ever made. Wonderful. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're going to do is go to the next slide as we continue to have Jay trying to uh, come in from Hunan. Um, the first part, as we mentioned uh, about this webinar, is going to focus on some cultural aspects of social interactions and relationships. So what I'm going to do is kind of change it a bit. And with Bethany and Suzanne, who are here, um, I'm going to ask you some of these questions, if uh, and please answer them as, as you feel comfortable based upon your experiences. and. If not, we'll just continue through other questions in the webinar. So the first part of this section, uh, this is going to go to Bethany, um, is focused on indirect communication. Um, can you potentially elaborate a bit on what this means and some of the differences in communication styles a Westerner may encounter in China? Yeah, so um, when I went to China, I had taken some Chinese before, but I have to say that I was wholly unprepared for the language barrier. Um, so in terms of communicating with others, um, really body language and customs really became so much more important um, than they had ever been to me before. So, um, you know, I think, you know, I had learned the basics. I had learned to say, how are you in Chinese? But it turns out nobody says that in China. They ask, have you eaten yet? That's kind of their way of, um, of saying hello and greeting you. So it's just those small cultural differences that um, it takes a while to pick up on. But um, I think as long as you're, um, keep your eye open and just really try to, to watch what's around you and don't come in with any kind of assumptions. Um, that was really the way I tried to overcome that. And just, you know, pay attention to body language and, um, you know, you'll realize once you're in a, an environment where you can't communicate with words how much more important um, this indirect communication becomes. Thank you, Bethany. Um, Suzanne, quickly about this indirect communication style in China. Um, can you give any examples or specific events where you noticed something in quote unquote inferred below the surface? Um, looking back, it was a lot of um, just wanting to be close to you, trying to uh, make friends. Um, you know, a lot of smiling, a lot of um, just um, just an openness. There was nothing very. Um, there was just so much friendliness and and just wanting to be near you. So I, I'm not sure. Um, there was no real issue. You know, a smile goes a long way, and um, everybody is just very friendly. Okay, wonderful. Thank, thank you, Suzanne, for, for sharing that. Um, the topic of Chinese culture is vast, so we're going to cover uh, the aspects that affect everyday life in China. Um, I'll preface that success in the World Teach China Global Education Fellowship does not depend on understanding Mandarin to start. You will gain this ability over time. I just want to kind of put that with, with some of the people who are listening in. Um, now quickly back to, to Bethany. Um, this, this second word here, this guan shi, is, as it is called, um, can you explain your interpretation of this world, word for the attendees? Yeah, so my interpretation is um, kind of, uh, I would say it revolves around relationships. So um, guan shi is kind of favor or um, if, if someone kind of, if you get brownie points in someone's book, then you've gotten some guan shi. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that explanation. And, and Suzanne, were you ever conscious of your Guanxi relationship with others in your school or community? Um, I was. I was um, always asked to be a part of uh, different. Um, I was asked to be on the volleyball team, um, go on trips with the kids um, outside of school, and um, I was always open to. Um, going with them. I mean, I never said no to anybody. So um, that led me to, I guess, have a favorable uh, relationship with the teachers and the headmaster. So um, I was 
then asked to do other things which you know benefited me as well as you know the school so um, I think that's very important that you're open to um, requests and um, you know just show yourself in a good light wonderful thank you thank you Suzanne uh, quickly back to Bethany the the third part here in social interactions and relationship is the role of authority. Can you share any stories about the role of authority in your school? What were some of your perceptions of the boss to employee relationship in Hunan? Yeah, so um, I found this really interesting just because um, my experience in the workforce here in the U.S. was quite different. Um, I found that um, authority is very revered in, in China and that I felt like um, the person at the very top of um, the chain, so to speak, really has a lot of a lot more weight, perhaps, than they do here in the U.S. Or, or you have to kind of move up the chain through each step. No one feels like here in the U.S., where some bosses have open door policies. Um, I kind of felt that there was a hesitancy uh, in China uh, to have that same kind of relationship. So, for example, um, we really wanted to find out when our semester was going to be ending, so that we could buy our plane tickets home. And it got to the point where we kept asking our liaison so many times. We said, well, you know, when is our semester going to end? Because it's so expensive to buy these tickets last minute. And it was getting to the point where it was, you know, a few weeks out. And we really wanted to make our travel plans. And I know that our liaison was really trying his best um, to get that information for us. But he just couldn't because he kept asking his boss. And I think he wasn't getting enough information. Um, and so I think we finally had to find a way to get it to go up the chain to the principal so that we could get those dates because he just didn't feel comfortable giving us the sign off. So I think um, in that sense, um, authority is very valued there and you really need to um, get the decision from the top before anyone feels comfortable giving you the okay for something. That's really interesting insight, Bethany, that, that, that hierarchy of communication structure. Um, that was kind of indirect in a way too. That's that's a great example. Um, Suzanne, uh, any additional thoughts or, or stories that you want to share in regards to the role of authority that you had in, in your placement with World Teach? Um, I think my experience was a little bit different because I'm I'm older, and so when I um, spoke with my liaison and had a question, it was always answered very quickly. <laughs> So um, maybe the age had a little bit to do with it, but um, yeah, I never had a problem um, interacting with the headmaster or um, getting any questions answered. So my experience was a little different. Great, Suzanne. So there was a difference because of, of, of age as far as how you were able to interact for a, kind of a boss-employee relationship? I believe so, yes. Okay, interesting. Um, thank you both for, for giving these stories and explanations of these different types of social interactions and relationships in China. We're going to move to the next part of our cultural session, which is the Chinese education system. Um, Bethany, I'll start with you. What are some of the differences that you noticed between Chinese and Western education systems? Yeah, so one huge difference that I'm sure many of you are aware of is uh, that in the Chinese education system, uh, kids really are expected to participate as much in class. Um, it's much more lecture-based. So as an oral English teacher, um, that can be challenging because you're trying to get kids to practice their English. So um, that was one of the main differences. Luckily, I had younger kids, junior ones, so they're a little bit more excited to participate. But I know especially with the older children, that can be um, really complicated. So that's a huge one. I also think that. Um, just the respect for teachers, I have to say, in China is, is really great. Um, they even have a, a teacher day, which I think we should have here in the U.S. <laughs> um, but those are just two main differences right off the bat. Great. And, and Suzanne, a uh, similar part is, is what were some areas of difference you noticed during your time uh, in China? Uh, were there any similarities with your previous education environments you had been exposed to in your life? Um. I never had any teaching experience previously, so it was an eye-opener to to see the amount of time that they spent in school from about 7.20 in the morning um, till 
sometimes nine o'clock at night. I mean, they were they would go leave their the middle school and then go to another school that was, um, you know, specifically for math or sciences or I mean, they were just constantly on the go. I think they got like one day off because they were, it's you know, in classes on Saturdays. Just unbelievable amount of pressure on these kids to perform well. And the parents, you know, spare no expense to, you know, get that additional um, classes for them. So it's just a huge um, undertaking for these kids. Thank you, Suzanne. That, that kind of leads into our, our next part of the education system is the expectations of Chinese students. Um, back quickly to Bethany, what were some of the major expectations of your students from their family and community? Yeah, so I know that um, in China, grades are so important. Um, they just really trump so many other um, aspects of an education. So um, my, my students in particular were very concerned about their grades. Um, you know, things like, um, you know, oral praise for participation. While they valued those things, what they really wanted to get was um, a very good written grade. So I think that um, that pressure to excel and to, to be as perfect as possible on your written record in terms of grades is, is really high. Okay. Um, Suzanne, anything to add from your own experience or feedback um, on the subject of the expectations of your students? You were definitely elaborating a little bit on that with these differences you saw in, in Western culture um, and education systems. Okay. It's, it's it's definitely a, a a big issue for them. Um, they, 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 the grade leads them to sit in the front of the class, or you know, it's just unbelievable, you know, the drive that they have to succeed. Great, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, talking about now the expectations from the student now to the teacher is for Suzanne. This is for you specifically. What were the requirements of you as a teacher in Jingyan Middle School? And what was your relationship like with your students? Uh, the expectation was, um, <laughs> it's a little funny, but the other teachers asked me not to smile so much. <laughs> I, they wanted me to be a little stricter, but I mean, that's just not a part of my nature. So um, I. I tried to work with them as much as I can, the other teachers, so that I was um, giving the uh, the help that they needed, you know, to use their um, their book and their workbook, so that I can create new lesson plans. So that you know, I was, you know, it went hand in hand with the other teachers, the English, the Chinese English teachers. And uh, I found that that was a really good way to work it. You know, I was always asking them for their advice so that I could benefit them, which, which was a big help. Thank you, Suzanne, for that. Um, Jay, if you can hear us, I think you've just come back in. Um, can you take a moment and give us a current sense of what schools are now looking for and expect from World Teach Fellows? for the next group that goes later this year, as far as teacher expectations? Okay. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, Jay, we were, just, cutting out we, were, of it. we were just talking about teacher expectations and going back and forth between Suzanne and Bethany, and just to you quickly, is coming in from Hunan, is can you take a moment and give us the current sense of what schools are now expecting from the World Teach Fellows and teachers will be coming later on this August. Have you seen any specific trends of requests? Okay, um, Jay is going in and out a bit. I'm, I'm gonna go quickly back to Bethany. Bethany, um, can you talk quickly about what your um, expectations were? So I'll be brief, because I don't wanna repeat something that's already been said. Um, but I think
Bethany, I'm going to come back to you. Um, can you talk quickly about the requirements that you had as far as your expectations at your school during your time in World Teach China? I'm sorry, Nola, was that directed at me? Yeah, we just were having some technical difficulties with Jay coming in from Hunan. So yeah, that's directly to you, Bethany, if you could answer. Yeah. So I have to say, as a, a foreign teacher, um, you know, you're not held to the exact same standards um, as Chinese teachers are just because um, you are usually in a unique circumstance. That's red. Um, you know, my Chinese counterparts were teaching the same kids every day. I would see my students once a week and teach, you know, 350 of them a week. So um, there's a different expectation there um, because, unfortunately, if you see your kids just once a week, um, it, it changes the dynamic. Um, but also in a positive way, you get to see and, and um, interact with a lot more more students. So um, that's one key difference. And I also think that um, just the expectation of being an expert in English was very high. Um, like Suzanne said, so many people would come to me with English questions, um, and they would really um, kind of look to me for, for answers on that and for clarification on that. And they were um, very respectful of the foreign teachers and the expertise that they provide in that um, area. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany, for that. We appreciate it. Um, moving to the next part of the webinar, we're looking at modern China. So modern China is filled with many conveniences. Bethany, can you speak a bit about how you communicate with friends and family back home as we're currently dealing with our country director, um, as well as with other teachers and friends in your community when you were in Hunan? Yeah, so um, the main way is WeChat. So if you haven't downloaded it, um, I'd recommend it. It's, it's basically what everybody uses um, in China to communicate. It's, it's kind of like Facebook, but it's actually better than Facebook, I think. Um, but that's a huge method of communication. Um, and in terms of keeping in touch with my family and friends, I found that the internet wasn't quite reliable enough to do um, frequent video calls, but um, you can actually make calls via WeChat, so that was a, a key way for me to keep in touch with my family. And it's free because, um, you know, it's all online. Awesome. Th thank you, Bethany. Uh, Suzanne, what were some of the, pla the places where you were able to buy everyday household items besides food? Like, what were some of the stores like in your, in your area? I actually lived across the street from a mall, so there was, um, <laughs> it was so convenient. Um, it was a huge supermarket inside this mall. There was a pizza hut. There was a um, bakery. There were um, little shops all around. There was an excellent place where you can get duck and rabbit and <laughs> just the most incredible food ever. So, um, yeah, shopping, there were, there were um, fresh produce, it, you know, just, you're, you would never go hungry there. <laughs> that's, that's good. That, that goes to the next <laughs> part, which is, is one of my favorite subjects, which is food. Um, quickly back to Bethany, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on some of your favorite foods that you had uh, while you were in Changja and in Hunan? Um, oh my gosh, there are so many, so many amazing foods. I can't limit it. But um, I will say the food in Hunan is um, rather spicy, and I personally didn't um, go into my year in China liking spicy food, but um, I actually did by the end of it. So if you're not used to spicy food, um, you may surprise yourself. But some of some of the best food that I had, um, they had like a, a late night barbecue that they often cook, and it's just all kinds of vegetables or meat on sticks. Um, and they just grill it right there for you. Um, that was some of my favorite. And it's available, um, you know, we're talking like 11 p.m. If you get hungry, you can go get it. So, And it's so cheap. It's ridiculously cheap. Great. Thank you. Um, you elaborate a little bit on this, on this, Suzanne. But going back, did you, did you find many Western chains or outlets um, while you were in Hunan? Yes, there's a lot of um, McDonald's everywhere. There's Burger Kings, um, Pizza Hut, like I said. Um, yeah, if you're looking for Western food, you can find it. Um, it's pretty expensive as compared to, you know, the traditional Chinese food. And 
But if you're looking for it, it's definitely there. Starbucks is everywhere also. Oh, boy. <laughs> 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 Thank you, though. Thank you for, for explaining that, that those, some of those, those places are prevalent there. Um, back to Bethany, this is kind of a, I think a concern that goes under the surface sometimes of, of about China and some misperceptions of the country is, is would you speak about the kind of China being a communist country and, and what are some of the common misconceptions foreigners may have? Um, so I have to say, I mean, I spent a year in China and I, I still feel like um, I only even began to understand it, um, even with just a year. Um, but I would say that um, I found the country to be remarkably safe. Um, I felt there, there are some aspects of, of um, the po political situation that I just didn't expect. Um, I found the people to be um, very proud of, of um, their country and, and um, I don't know, politics is something I really tried to shy away from because I really felt like I was there to just learn and absorb other people's perspectives on it. Um, so it's, I'll just say it's interesting and I try to um, just kind of take it as a learning experience more than trying to express my own views about it. Yeah, I, Beth, I think that's a good good way to be with, with really any Thing you do that's that's out of your your environment that you come from or something that's comfortable is, is just to kind of observe and, and not to take it either sides of it and just to kind of be there and be accommodating and try to assimilate is I think uh, a recipe for success in, in going to someplace like China so so thank you thank you for sharing that um, we're gonna move on to the next section which is a little more of the logistics and information about this fellowship structure and support so you'll see to the left kind of what goes in as far as the, the support that you receive as a, a World Teach China Global Education Fellow. Uh, your visa is sponsored. Um, housing is included, which is teacher apartments we'll go into in a little bit. Uh, health and emergency insurance. Uh, three to four weeks of orientation, including teacher training and practicum, language immersion, cultural training, safety and security. Uh, mid and end of service conferences full-time in-country field staff, as, as Jay is there, meals and housing during orientation and conferences, transportation to your teaching sites, and then you have professional learning communities and teaching resources. So these professional learning communities through our Department of Education in our World Teach office supply you with a lot of facilitating tools and resources to get involved in your community and get other teachers uh, to be involved in certain kind of projects or, or classroom management that you're doing as well. So they're, they're super helpful. Uh, for for you being the teacher. Now, the fellowship side, as far as the framework of the fellowship, is a little different than our uh, previous World Teach volunteer programs. What we do is uh, give you a intercultural competence uh, measurement. It's called an intercultural development inventory, or the IDI assessment and coaching, which is optional. This is basically done before your 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 program and after. And it gives you kind of a quantifiable way to look at your cultural competence. And we work with you uh, based upon what the inventory has given us to enhance your cultural competence and make you, make you more mindful of both your environment and yourself. And it's something that's a really nice tool um, that sets the tone for your growth as a culturally competent person. Um, we set up experiential reflection. Uh, these are post-experience or excursion questions that deepen your understanding of how the intersection of globalization education impact students' futures and learning. We also have an ongoing structured language training, which we, we ha will have for all the fellows. Uh, so you'll be learning Mandarin on a regular basis. We have professional development seminars as well, which focus again on this force of globalization and their impacts on education and national development. And these will be done uh, generally every other month with key education, economics, and cultural lecturers. Um, we also have an accredited TEFL certification, which is optional, which we'll go over. And we have career mentoring sessions uh, with either World Teach staff or alumni, potentially maybe even Bethany or Suzanne, um, upon the fellowship conclusion, just to kind of put into context what you had just experienced. And finally, you'll have access to our network of over 7,000 uh, World Teach alumni. 
So as mentioned, the fellowship is fully funded, except all fellows have to pay their way to Hunan. That is the only cost, is, is the flight directly uh, to, to World Teach China. The next portion as we'll go is talking about life outside the classroom. If and when you're accepted, you'll usually find out your placement one month before departure for China. All of our fellows will be in the Hunan province, which could be the capital city of Changsha, smaller cities, which may still be quite big with a million people, or town placements with populations still sometimes over 50,000 people. All fellows will live in teacher apartments on or near school grounds, usually in their own apartment, but near other fellows or teachers. Um, you'll see the list of amenities below, which is very comfortable for China, and for World Teach placements in general. Housing and utilities are listed here. They're all provided by your schools. So quickly to Bethany, who was in Changsha, can you explain how your location affected your experience in China? Yeah, so when I signed up for World Teach, I actually um was originally thinking I wanted a rural placement, um, but I got an urban placement right next to the fast train station. Um, so even though it wasn't what I had initially pictured myself going into, I have to say it was a, a wonderful location um, just because it was so easy for me to travel. Um, that said, it also was outside of the city, so, um, you know, there were not, there wasn't too much going on <laughs> in my side, my side of the city. Um, but you know, you become close with the people around you, um, and I think uh, we really managed to build our own community in our school and with um, the local restaurant owners. And and you know, you'll meet so many people there um, just walking the streets. So um, I think no matter where you go, you can manage to to build a community for yourself. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bethany. Uh, Suzanne, quickly. How can you compare your experience with Bethany's? Can you tell us what was the best and worst part about your housing in a little bit of a different environment? Um, I had a pretty good, uh, I was a little bit off the uh, school campus. It was like uh, one block away. Um, it was a really huge apartment. You know, I could have fit four people in there. Um, everything was in walking distance. Um, downtown was you know, maybe like a 10 minute walk. Uh, the buses are frequent. Um, I, I, I wanted for nothing. Everything was brand new in the apartment. Everything I could have thought of was there. I was pleasantly surprised. I thought I was going to have to buy everything myself, but they really took great care of me there uh, in uh, Jingyang. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad that's that's good. <laughs> that's, a, that's a positive. Yeah, it's amazing. Great, great, Suzanne. Thank, thank you for sharing that. And, and quickly back to Bethany, um, a little bit more of the time outside of the classroom as mentioned is what was your average weekend like? Uh, what activities did you participate in outside of school? Or how did you immerse yourself in the community? Did you have a chance to travel? And in general, how did you kind of create a life for yourself there? And did you find any parts of it difficult? Yeah, so I was actually amazed by how much free time I had um, just because I I wasn't sure how it was going to go. You know, I had no, um, you know, career teaching experience prior to going to China. So, um, you know, it took me a while to start getting my lesson plans um, in order. But after I got into the swing of things, I actually had um, a lot of free time on my hands um, just because the way they do schedules in Chinese schools is different here than um, different there than it is in the U.S. Uh, you know, they have a very long lunch hour, um, and the time that you spent, um, you know, in class makes up just, it's a, it's a, a lot smaller amount of um, hours in the classroom than it is here. Um, so that said, I just, I filled my time with exploring the city. Um, I made some good friends um, in my local area, and you'll never know where you're going to make friends. One of my best friends um, that I still keep in contact was um, the owner of a local noodle shop where I just popped into and I started becoming a regular. Um, and then, you know, I ended up going on trips with her family. So I, I think I just tried to um, immerse myself in the community and in my free time also. Um, I study Chinese, although not as much as I wish I had. But <laughs> Uh, yeah, just exploring the city and traveling. 
That's really uh, great that you still stay in touch with your friend who owned the noodle shop. I think that that's, um, I had something similar in, in my time in Brazil. My, my closest friend became uh, this local coconut water vendor. And um, I, I think that I spent hours with him every day just listening to his wise words. So that's that's really, really cool that that's the type of relationship you developed, Bethany. Um, so for kind of for both of you, Suzanne and Bethany, thinking, going back now kind of to health and safety, um, what was, so thank you for Suzanne, what, what sort of health care access did you have near your placement? Um, just kind of describe it, what the situation was. Hopefully you didn't have to utilize it, but just curious about what it was like as far as finding health care access. Um, it wasn't a problem. There was a hospital that was directly across the street from the school. Um, the minute you start to sniffle or cough, um, other teachers are... Um, giving you home remedies or, you know, taking you to the drugstore to get whatever you need. So um, I was fortunate enough not to, you know, have it. But, um, you know, there were just, you know, wanting to give you the hot teas or, um, but the medical uh, was right across the street. So, you know, wouldn't have had to go far if I, if I had needed it. Okay, Suzanne, that's that's good to know. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, back to Bethany in regards to safety and, and living in a, a large city. Is Can you address how the safety was in Changzhou, which I know it's it's different between the cities that we're in in Hunan, but can you just talk a little bit about um, safety and how you felt uh, during your time when you were there? Yeah, so I have to say that I felt... Um, remarkably safe. I actually felt a lot safer than I, I do here in the U.S. Um, I left my apartment door open uh, one weekend and I was gone for about three hours and then I got a message from my neighbor on WeChat saying that, hey, your apartment door is open. Um, so I ran home thinking that, you know, my laptop would have been stolen, <laughs> everything from inside my apartment that was valuable would be gone. Um, but no, I showed up and it was just just as I had left it. Um, I will say that I lived um, on the school grounds, so I think that really helped me feel very secure. But um, in terms of walking around the city, um, there's so many people around at all times, and it's very well lit. So I just really felt um, very safe. Okay, Bethany, thank, thank you for, for sharing that. and. Uh... And leaving your door open in a, a large city that's uh, yeah you wouldn't you wouldn't think about that and being comfortable with it sometimes. I don't recommend it but yeah no I'm glad I'm glad you were I, I sometimes get oblivious and do that too and, and shouldn't so but that, that's great I'm, I'm glad that that everything was safe when you were there um, moving on to our next session section is the application process and requirements so participants in the China Global Education Fellowship program uh, must be native English speakers of any nationality and hold a bachelor's degree by the, the application deadline. Um, you must be either TEFL or, or TESOL certified or have at least two years of post-college work experience. As mentioned, you must have a bachelor's degree, a physical diploma by application deadline, uh, be between the ages of 21 and 60, and our general part of be flexible, mature, have a genuine interest in teaching, and have a humility and an open-mindedness to you as well. As you'll see, there's a little star on the bottom left here, and this says applicants for the China program can get TEFL certified through a modified World Teach TEFL certification program during pre-departure. The deadline is complete is to complete the online certification is May 15th. The required application items as well are listed above in the top right. And you'll see that the requirements for application through admissions is a resume, a personal statement, and a transcript. One letter of recommendation, then if you move to stage two of the application process, you'll have an interview with our World Teach Director of Admissions, Caitlin Ivester. Finally, the program dates and deadlines, as you'll see on the bottom right, applications will be accepted until April 1st, and the decision will be made two to three weeks after your application is complete. We do things on a rolling basis, so the earlier you submit, the more likely you are to be accepted. Um, fellows will depart in early August of 2017 and return in July 2018. 
I will make one note about the part of the fellowship program where it's a requirement of a bachelor's degree by application deadline. So we are still in the midst of working with our government partners to potentially change this requirement in their policy <coughs> to where the diploma will have to be given by, the, by a little later part in the year, which could enable people who are graduating to participate in the program. Just please stay on the lookout. You'll have announcements from us if this does, in fact, change. And we're able to actually have people who don't have their physical diploma by April 1st still apply for the program. So right now, we're at our Q&A portion of our webinar. So we had a number of questions kind of come in for those who had uh, signed up for the webinar, who are attending it right now. And what I'm going to do is address them one by one and then uh, place them with our alumni too. And we'll address any questions that are coming up right now from the current attendees. So the first question, which we'll go over, uh, is it possible to extend the year-long fellowship to another year? Uh, the answer to that question is, is yes, with our fellowships and our volunteer programs. 10% uh, of our fellows and volunteers around the world extend their time. And um, the second part to the question was, can you connect me with previous fellows or volunteers? And absolutely, we have country experts for every one of our World Teach programs, and we're happy to connect you with one of them, one of our China alumni who serve as a country expert. Um, we'll have an email on the next page that you can email directly to. Um, another question, I'll kind of bring this over to Bethany, is the question that came in that says, what is the air quality like in Hunan? Uh, Bethany, what was the air quality like when you were there? Um. So it's not great. Uh, I was in Changsha, uh, which I think has around 6 uh, million people. So, um, you know, if you can imagine a cloudy day, that's what it looked like um, for much of the year. But I have to say, in terms of um, getting used to it, um, you do. I, I didn't wear a mask, and I don't know of any other volunteers who did wear a mask. Um, no one else wears one there. So even just in terms of um, kind of blending into life, I, I felt like, that's why I didn't want to do it, but um, you you can get used to it, uh, but it isn't great. <laughs> so what were some of the things uh, you did to adjust? Was it, um, did you try to limit your time outside or, or was uh, a mask or something like that? What, what were, was there anything that you did to try and um, prevent a, a exposure to, to some of the, the pollution? You know, I didn't notice it. I mean, I, I saw it, um, but in terms of how I actually felt, um, I still went running outside um, on a regular basis. Um, you know, I didn't feel like it interfered with my life. Um, it was actually surprising to me how quickly I adapted to it. But um, when you first see it, it can be, um, you know, a bit of a surprise just because our air here is so clean. But in terms of how it affected my daily life, it, it really didn't. Okay, uh, th thank you, Bethany. Um, quickly, uh, a question came in from one of our attendees uh, named Kelly, and um, I'll go to either Suzanne or Bethany with this, is can you speak to your job search experience upon returning from China? Uh, maybe Bethany, you can start, and then Suzanne, you can, you can go right, right after. Yeah, so um, I really loved my time in China, and I worked in a completely different industry before I worked in aviation publishing. And so when I came back, um, because I had already been in the workforce, um, I had um, some job potential in the aviation field, but I really enjoyed my time in China, and I really wanted to stay um, in international education. So um, I was actually able to find a job. I actually share an office now with a former um World Teach China alum. So um, in terms of, of where you want to take this experience, I think if you want to stay in education, it's a natural fit. But even if you don't, I think um, the international experience can really, um, it can benefit a lot of different areas. And I felt like when I told people that this is what I was going to do um, at my old job, they were all um, very supportive and they all um, we're very interested in it. So it in no way, I, I think that most people were um, receptive to to this um, to this kind of area of, of work, and it could definitely serve to your advantage depending on what you want to do in the future.
Suzanne, do you care to share any of the information of how it was coming back in after your time in China? Well, I have a home-based business, so I, I wasn't out looking in the, you know, looking um, for a new position. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work, which is um, still great because I'm working with kids and I, I really enjoy it. I'm even thinking about, you know, maybe going back to China, uh, you know, <laughs> in August. <laughs> so, um, great. <laughs> Yeah, and everywhere I go, you know, I am telling people about World Teach because I think it was just, you know, such a, a great um, time. And I think it, when you're young, you should do it. But it, even when you're older, you know, it's still a, a, a great experience. Thank you, Suzanne. And, and just to elaborate a little bit on, on Kelly's question, 20% um, of the world's population is from China. It's the second biggest economy in the world and very soon potentially maybe the first. Uh, the necessity to understand Chinese culture and potentially Mandarin is, is a, a very valuable tool and skill to have as you're going into the global workforce. Uh, I'll say that the experience of, of living in, in another culture and working in it and immerse, immersed in it uh, brings out certain transferable skills that you can use in any aspect of business. Um, from critical thinking and problem solving to more of these 21st century skills like social intelligence and, and being able to work with remote teams or re work remotely and virtually. And also this cross-cultural competence that we mentioned is, according to a, a study from the Institute for the Future, is the fourth most coveted skill is intercultural competence, that more businesses are looking for people who have dual language and understanding of other cultures. So. Um, there's value in doing something like this in any facet that you decide to do in the next next phase of your career, just to kind of kind of put that out there. Um, the next question we had, uh, which we kind of went over, but I'll go quickly, was what do you mean by intercultural competence assessment and action plan? Also, how does mentoring work in your program? We kind of went over that a little bit previously in the webinar, but again, we use this tool called the Intercultural Development Inventory and we do this assessment both pre- and post-program experience um, and be able to work with you on this kind of coaching and action plan. And then the mentoring where we'll, towards the end of your experience, connect you uh, with either World Teach staff or other alumni of the China program um, as you're potentially making your way back into ass assimilating into your, your home country. Uh, the final question we had was, do you accept individuals with dependents? And this question basically, World Teach is only responsible for the placements and support of their fellows or volunteers. Uh, no other assistance is provided for dependents or immediate family. And looking through right now, uh, any other questions? Those are all the questions that came through. So at this time, uh, I want to thank uh, our attendees who were able to join us and listen in to get more information about Chinese culture, as well as, excuse me, as well as some of the logistics of our World Teach China Global Education Fellowship, and also uh, much much appreciated to our alumni. Uh, they'll take a virtual bow, uh, Suzanne and Bethany, for joining us and. For Jay, who was in Hunan, um, had woke up early this morning at, at 6.30 in the morning to try and join us, but unfortunately didn't have the correct internet speed. Um, but thank you again for joining us. Um, as you can see here, here are some of your next steps. You can read alumni reviews of our program. Um, ask to speak with a China country expert by emailing admissions at worldteach.org. Um, go on YouTube. You can see different day in the life videos from World Teach China. And then on our website is the China Global Education Fellowship page, which you can give you all the latest information. You can also find us all over social media. So, uh, again, thank you again, Bethany and Suzanne, for joining us and for all our attendees. And, and we hope to see you very soon in World Teach China. <laughs>